I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. In 1957, a girl was born in Guangdong, a southeastern Chinese province bordering Hong Kong. She grew up modestly, first working for a paper trading company in Shenzhen in her early 20s, but eventually making her way up to an accounting position in Hong Kong, at the time a bustling center for business and trade. And eventually she determined to become an entrepreneur herself and opened a papermaking factory in Hong Kong. And much of China's forests were cleared during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution between 1958 and 1976 to make way for agricultural land. And this meant that most paper in China had to be produced from bamboo, rice stock, or by diluting pulp with water. And so consequently, paper quality was poor in China compared to the American version made from solid wood pulp. And this reality provided Zhang Yin with a sense of opportunity. And in 1990, at the age of 33, she decided to leverage her knowledge of the Chinese paper business and take a leap of faith by moving to Los Angeles, USA. There, she and her husband drove a van from landfills to scrap yards, purchasing bales of American scrap paper for cheap and shipping them back to Hong Kong for sale as a recycling input for better quality paper production. She formalized this operation into a company that quickly grew to own several collection centers, purchasing scrap paper for $30 a ton, which she would then sell back home at $100 a ton after shipping them for cheap in Chinese shipping containers, having been emptied from importing sneakers and other goods on the U.S. port. This business model was so successful that Zhang Yin decided to vertically integrate her business. She moved back to Hong Kong in 1995 and opened her own paper factories once again, but this time using the inputs that she shipped from the U.S. and under a new brand, Nine Dragons Paper. The rest, as they say, is history. By 2007, Nine Dragons had 8,300 employees, $1.4 billion in annual revenue, and it was one of the largest producers of container board and recycled paper products in the world. Today. Zhang is the fourth richest woman in China. This episode brought to you by Nine Dragons Paper for all your paper needs. Go to ninedragons.com forward slash ashes ashes cast to receive 10% all your (laughs) container board products. (laughs) It's funny, Daniel, but it really does sound like like we're just uh, spitting out this giant paper ad. So I mean, what what does this have to do with with the show topic today? Like, where are you taking this? Well, there's a purpose to this story, David. And I mean, one is just this, this incredible narrative of how one woman became one of the richest women in the world um, by dealing in the trash business, in recycled goods and shipping the waste of one country, in this case, the United States, to another country that can then use that uh, for various things. And <laughs> I mean, there's nothing we love more on Ashes Ashes than a good bootstrap story, right? <laughs> Right. But, you know, another thing that this story highlights, I think, is the purpose, which we'll get to, uh, but I don't want to give the whole, you know, message away here. But, you know, when we think about recycling, what is it that we're often, uh, you know, what is the motivation? Usually something green related, right? Saving the planet. But we see that recycling as an industry plays an important role in making people rich. And why that happens, I think, is something worth questioning. And what is the true Uh, purpose of this industry? And is it really the green movement that we would like it to be? But, you know, going back to your original question, David, this show is about trash, specifically the global trash and, and municipal solid waste that we as consumers and producers around the world generate in our day to day lives and what we do with that trash. How appropriate a show about trash from your favorite trash hosts on your favorite trash podcasts. But enough self-deprecation there, Daniel. Uh, Well, at least we recycle material. Yeah, like we did, unfortunately, a couple of episodes ago. 
Uh, but today we're going to be learning about how recycling, just like we did here on the show, is oftentimes a scam. You aren't getting what you think. Uh, and we're going to really tear down this whole idea of trash and dig into it and explore all these things we don't think about. When you take your whatever you don't want, throw it in the garbage can, and ask the question, well, what happens next? And this has really become a huge defining part of our modern civilization and the, some of the problems we face, especially environmentally. I mean, how much do we talk about the plastic problems in the water? I know we've had several episodes on that. The huge amounts of pollutants that all this trash can cause, uh, the air pollution from burning trash or from the trash itself, the methane released, uh, which is a potent greenhouse gas uh, from all this decaying trash. All this stuff ties into so many separate parts of this show. But it's this sort of hidden underbelly of so much of our civilization and society. And more than enough time has passed of us not addressing this thing that really underpins so much of what we're talking about, trash. So let's, let's dig in. Well, speaking of perspectives on trash, you know, we here in America, David, I think we do have a limited perspective on how trash disposal and collection can and should work. If you live in a suburb, for instance, you're familiar with those big rolling bins issued by uh, the local municipality that you roll out to the curb once a week and then big trash trucks come and collect it all, take it away. Or if you're in the city, maybe you throw your trash in a public dumpster or pile it up on the street for trash trucks to pick up. But this isn't how it's done everywhere. Taiwan, for example, has a pretty unique way of dealing with waste management. So here in America, we have dumpsters, we have if you walk down the sidewalk of New York City or any... Yeah, we just dump it out on the sidewalks. There is no fanfare about it. They're just piles of trash on the sidewalk, as is the New York way. Though in our defense, <laughs> we do have one section. Um, Roosevelt Island has this really amazing suction-based trash system where there's basically chutes all over the island where you toss your trash in and it's whisked away to the central trash processing plant. It runs it through a centrifuge to separate it, um, gets all the materials separated, and and takes it into whatever it needs to be, either burned or recycled or disposed of elsewhere. Um, and that is a really great example of what beautiful, uh, efficient trash collection could be like. But Roosevelt Island is small, the system is expensive, and it's very impractical for a large area even one as dense as New York City. Yeah, that's interesting. Taiwan, a small island nation, this is another small area where they figured out a more efficient way of collecting trash. Over there, you won't find any trash piled up on the streets like in New York, but you won't even find those like public trash cans that you can throw your coffee cup into after you leave the shop. In fact, the way they collect trash is they, they do have those big trash trucks, except they play nice classical music <laughs> and they show up twice an evening every weekday to these central locations and when residents hear that music they know it's time to bring their trash down and, and the bags they have and throw it in the truck and again like i said this is unique because there are no public trash dumpsters or cans that means if you go to a coffee shop and you buy a coffee cup and you leave with that you got to take it home with you and then put it in your trash bag which is an interesting way to spread the cost of trash disposal and collection as well because in order to dispose of your trash into these trucks, you have to purchase an official trash bag. And you can do that in different sizes, depending on how much waste you generate. Uh, so if you waste more, you pay more. And in addition, recycling bags are a separate cost. And the trucks that collect that, they have multiple receptacles for different types of recyclable material. And if you miscategorize those, or if you do end up throwing your trash on the street, there are hefty fines. I'm just imagining these giant garbage trucks going down the street, Daniel, playing Paco Bell's Canon in D or something, uh, which is a hilarious image. But Mozart's for Elise as well. Yeah, as, as they come down. Uh, but uh, one, one thing that's really apparent about this is, I mean, the things that are happening here aren't especially different in the end result as what's happening in the United States. But there's a lot of the processes that are more upfront and apparent to you, the end user. I mean, here... Our trash ends when we wheel the trash can outside. We don't have to think about what we're throwing in there, the size, the amount of trash that we're throwing out, like you mentioned. Um, I guess in some municipalities, you might have to pay more. Like, say, if you're disposing uh, leaves, they might require special long clipping bags or something to that effect. Um, maybe your municipality, uh, if you're recycling, needs uh, separation or whatever. And um, we'll get to that later. But that's it. That's where the thought ends. Everything is a sort of one size fits all approach. But What's happening in Taiwan is you are very aware of trash, uh, how much you're disposing, um, your responsibility to make sure it gets where it needs to go, 
or else you face those fines. The contamination issue, which is something we'll address later on in this episode, all this stuff is, is sort of immediately shifted to the end user so they're aware of it. And maybe because they're aware of it, they're that much more conscious of the trash that they're using. Whereas here, we're just happy to throw things away, dispose them, drop them on the street, and never think about it again. And that may be part of the reason why we have such a throwaway culture in so many things. And again, we'll talk about more of that in a little bit. But let's- I don't know, David. All I know is that uh, my trash trucks don't play classical music, and that's a problem. Just, it, they wouldn't play classical music here. It would be turkey in the straw coming down the street. Turkey in the straw? Trash can in the truck. Just grab your cycling, throw it in the back. Here comes the garbage truck for your stuff. Hmm. Pretty good. Nice. But uh, my bad singing aside, as long as we are talking about trash trucks, uh, we came across this funny story as we we're reading all this endless articles about trash uh, and reminded us of something we talked about a long time ago, way back in episode 25, heat death, where one of the things we discussed was this very high temperatures of heat that we're starting to see in certain parts of the world. I think we mentioned the UK, we mentioned parts of the US, especially Australia, uh, and this is mostly resulting from climate change. One of the things it can cause is melting roads. And, well, we saw this topic come up within this trash conversation. And so uh, last July, a road in Newberry, Berkshire, had to be closed after a trash truck, or bin lorry, as they call them in the UK, sunk into the road, most likely because a combination of the searing temperatures that caused this asphalt to soften up, as well as the extreme weight of this heavily loaded in lorry as it was filled with trash. And as long as we're talking about the UK, David, uh, we cannot forget to mention Fridge Mountain. Oh, Fridge Mountain. Tell me more. So in 2002, the European Union put into effect a new rule that old refrigerators that had those chlorofluorocarbons in their foam insulation could not be dumped in landfills since those CFC chemicals would eventually be released and contribute to atmospheric ozone depletion which, as we've talked about, would practically turn the sun from a source of warm, tanning rays of light into a radioactive killer of most life on the planet. (laughs) And that might be a little bit of exaggeration, but I I get the gist. Keep going. I I don't think so, David. But anyway, Britons did not realize until the last minute that this new rule would mean that they couldn't ship their old fridges to developing countries, nor could they crush them up, as that would indiscriminately release those CFCs. Instead, they would need high-tech fridge-eating machines that could also extract the chemical CFCs for proper disposal. But they didn't have any of these machines in the country. So for the first two-thirds of the year, these used fridges started piling up everywhere. Households could not get rid of them easily. Uh, The stores would not buy them. And so some enterprising people started charging consumers like 10 euros to come pick up their fridges, but then they'd just go dump them in the countryside somewhere. And so within the first couple months or so of this new rule, there were already 1 million fridges stacked up randomly around uh, the UK with an additional 40,000 a week being added to these piles. Wait, 1 million fridges within a few months? I mean, that that number seems staggering. There's only, what, there's like 63 or 64 million people in the entire UK, and, and within a couple months, they've thrown out a million fridges? If this doesn't highlight the huge amount of waste that we're generating, I don't think anything in this show will, but keep keep going, keep going. Well, I think that's an interesting point, David, because since we have these trash collecting infrastructures, I, I don't think many of us aren't aware, right? We don't see the end result of all this waste that's being produced because it's promptly whisked away. But as the Chinese ban on foreign waste, which we'll talk about and which we mentioned last year in our our Life in Plastics episode, episode 19, um, the moment you cut the flow of this trash disposal infrastructure off, you see the immediate effects. Things start piling up quickly because there's just so much of it and it's constant. And um, we'll talk about where all this goes. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think outside of events like this or the very recent China development, which again, as you mentioned, we'll address, uh, the only time people realize or think about trash and how much there is uh, in their day-to-day lives is either when they're driving past the landfill and they have to close the windows and put the air conditioner on inside circulation so they don't get a whiff of that. Or two, uh, the few times, and uh, I guess this doesn't happen as much in the suburbs, but if you live in a city, when the trash collectors decide for whatever reason, probably because their pensions are getting cut, to go on strike, 
And then you'll have, you know, a couple of days of no trash collection, maybe a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden the streets are just filled with giant, huge amounts of trash. And it's insane how much trash we actually generate, but never see until it's not being collected and whisked away and carried off somewhere out of sight and out of mind. Um, but usually those strikes don't last very long because the effect is so overwhelming and it can quite literally shut down mm-hmm. cities within a few days. Well, and that's not the only way people become aware of all this waste. And as long as we're talking about the UK, which is a place near a large body of water, we should mention the depressing reality of how all this waste affects many ocean life. And just a couple of days ago, March 18th, a dead whale washed up on a coast in the Philippines. And it was determined that the cause of death was attributed to the 40 kilograms or 88 pounds of plastic that were found in its stomach. The scientists that examined the whale said it was the most plastic that they've ever seen in an animal. And the items include at least 16 rice stacks, four banana plantation style bags, and multiple plastic shopping bags. And of course, as we talked about in that Life in Plastics episode, the amount of of plastic and other trash that we're adding to our oceans is just mind boggling. And it's only going to increase exponentially unless we can do something to curb all this overconsumption and production. Yeah, this is just one whale that we use as an example, but there are so many stories about both uh, marine mammals, whales, dolphins, uh, as well as seabirds, fish that are just overflowing with garbage when they eventually die from this and are found on the beach. Uh, Scientists look into the cause of the death and just find them spilling out with plastic and other uh, materials. It's a huge, huge problem. And this is not really the focus of this show by any means, but it is something that we need to be aware of that these Huge amounts of trash that we're generating, um, the recycling that we're unable to actually take care of. It all has consequences, not just on the world and not just on ourselves, but also on all these very fragile ecosystems and the animals that compose them throughout the world. Well, why don't we talk numbers then, David, on, on some of this global trash? My favorite part. Let's go. In 2016, we generated 2.01 billion tons of municipal solid waste. And by 2030, if nothing changes, that 2.01 billion tons will grow to 2.59 billion tons each year. And by 2050, we'll be generating 3.4 billion tons of annual waste, which is a 70% increase from present day levels. So just one second, Daniel, before you keep going with your spiel here, I want to just break down that enormous number that we're generating right now, that 2 billion tons figure, and put it sort of in a context. Because what is a ton. It's hard to visualize a ton by weight. I mean, that's the size of a car. Uh, it's half a car if it's if it's a newer one. But uh, and then also two billion. That's such a huge number. So just really quickly, and and we are going to get to per capita stuff in a moment. But just to help us visualize how much stuff this is, if you divide this down more or less by every single person on Earth, round it down a little bit to make our math a little more simple. Um, Two billion tons divided by seven billion people or so. That means each one of us on this earth is responsible, sort of, for about 260 kilograms of trash annually. So that's 573 pounds. And if you take that and you think about it every day, how much trash am I generating? That's about a pound and a half of trash a day, or about three quarters of a kilogram a day. Maybe an easier way to visualize it even than that is think about this annually, you are generating half the mass of an entire dairy cow in pure garbage. It's a lot. By weight. We're not even talking volume here, but keep going, keep going. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, <laughs> the, the story is, is much, much, much worse than that, David, because you just quoted a, a global figure, but we'll break that down by region. But first, we know that this growth in waste is going to contribute to climate change because already The treatment, disposal, and collection of trash worldwide accounts for some 5% of our total annual greenhouse gases. Isn't that about the same as as air traffic? Um, I don't even know if air traffic is that takes that big of a share of the pie. I think air traffic is like 1% or something. I thought it was like 4. Damn, I'm pulling up all the facts and figures right now. Here's the EPA. Transportation is 28%. Aircraft is 9% in the U.S. So aircraft is 9% in the so U.S. So it, it's about the same as all rail and ships and boats traffic. 5%? Yeah. Well, it's more than that. That's about 4%, it looks like, in the U.S. anyway. Well, that's some comparisons for y'all. But 
You know, one thing that gets cited a lot in this broader conversation about global trash is how the developing world contributes to all this. And a favorite stat to point out is that the growth trajectory of this global trash will occur fastest in low-income countries. It will triple in sub-Saharan Africa, double in South Asia, and double in the Middle East and North Africa. But that's just growth trends, not the totality of waste contribution. And so before you say, ah, it's those pesky uh, developing country people who are reproducing and developing too quickly that are the cause of all this waste, let's come back to this per capita discussion, David, that you brought up. So in terms of total waste, high income countries where we find just 16% of the global population, those countries are responsible for 34% of total waste. While these low income countries with just 9% of the global population are responsible for a mere 5% of total waste. And in terms of per capita, North America is the leader here at 2.21 kilograms of waste that we are producing per person every single day. So that's uh, much larger than that 0.75 kilogram figure that you uh, mm-hmm. that you cited as the global average. And for comparison, Asia the Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa all produce around 0.5 kilograms of waste per person each day. But I mean, that, that makes intuitive sense, right? This shouldn't be a surprise. Wealthier populations consume more, uh, generating the most waste, and in urban regions have the highest levels of wealth and consumption. And North America is both wealthy and the region with the highest levels of urbanization in the world. So we really shouldn't be surprised by that. Okay, so I mean, that's talking about how much trash we're generating, but where does it all end up? How's it divided? So let's look at this breakdown here. So we're talking in this episode specifically about municipal trash. Um, And I want to make a distinction real quick. Uh, When we were trying to figure out how to tackle this episode, it's like, well, do we talk about trash uh, in this very sense of uh, this is what the stuff we throw away personally every day? Um, as well as the recycling, or are we going to talk about waste, which is sort of a larger concept? Uh, it involves more manufacturing. Questions about that, and we decided to pare it down specifically to trash, uh, particularly because of this China recycling stuff, which we'll get to in a moment. I, 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 let's see how many times I can say that across this episode. Um, and so, so the focus here is, like I said, very much on municipal disposal of this garbage, uh, and and how this breaks down is forty percent of it is being put into landfills. So these are these giant piles of trash that someday archaeologists, if there are still humans around, will be overjoyed to discover and dig through and find all this horrible stuff about our culture uh, with these giant monuments of our waste. And uh, I mean, I guess that's not a new concept, is it, Daniel? How much of human history is literally built on the garbage of other previous cultures coming before it? I mean, well, we talked about in one episode how in the future, when archaeologists look back, the greatest uh, sign of human civilization in the present day will not be our structures. It will not be all these things we've built. It will be the massive layer of chicken bones mm-hmm. that we leave in the Earth's crust that future scientists will look at and just be like flabbergasted at <laughs> where all this came They'd be like, wow, they from. had a lot of well, chickens ruled the Earth. Um, but I, I mean, even beyond that, I mean, cities like London, like Rome, are slowly getting taller because they're built on old layers of trash. Uh, this is a human tradition as old as time. And you can see this really in that nearly half of our trash is still ending up in these giant landfills, even though we're taking them away from the cities, putting it somewhere else, uh, trying to compress it as much as possible. It's still our primary way of disposing all this waste that we create. Um, on top of that, is either recycled or composted. Uh, This varies by place to place. Uh, This number is decreasing all the time. And what recycling means is up for debate. We'll talk about that in a moment. I think that figure also came from a like a uh, industrial friendly report by the global (laughs) uh, by the World Bank, I think. Yeah. In academic papers, I've also I've seen the standard figure being that like all plastic that we've ever produced, for example, like less than 9%, I think, yeah. has ever been recycled. And then in the US, we're like approaching 4%. Yeah. The numbers I keep seeing are 2017 was a great year for recycling. We were at 9% of all waste was recycled. 2018 following this ban was a disastrous year. We are down to 4 point something percent. And uh, it's expected to decrease even more this year, both because we are increasing the waste we generate and recycling less and less of it. Uh, so take take that figure with a little bit of a grain of salt. 
Um, but we're trying to be optimistic here. So I would love if we could hit 19%, especially if a lot of it is composting, which is the best way that we can turn this waste into something useful. But okay, so that's 40% is in landfills. Nearly 20% is recycled or composted if we're being optimistic. 11% is incinerated. And before we, we all gasp and say, oh no, you know, this is actually one of the better ways of dealing with this trash where there's just too much of it. Uh, some of the incineration is used for uh, power generation. Uh, this is a very popular program in Philadelphia right now, among many other cities. Uh, but it also is a, if it's done right, is one of the better ways to make sure that you're not polluting with this trash. Very high temperature incineration is actually a very clean way of disposing this stuff. And it breaks down a lot of these harmful chemicals in an efficient way. Um, but the downside of this, of course, is that it releases huge amounts of greenhouse gases into the air. So while we are disposing of this trash, we are making our climate change problem worse. Uh, there's always a trade-off, and that's where some of the energy generation that we're getting out of this comes from. So 11% is incinerated. And then the last third, Daniel, well, if we're not dumping it in landfills, if we're not recycling it, and if we're not burning it, what happens? We ship it to space where we eject it into the infinite void and never have to worry about it again. <laughs> in the future, maybe. <laughs> that's that's the future, baby. It's just launch it straight into the sun. Um, as, as we just have to launch it past the, uh, the Kessler, or the Kepler, Kepler point, the Kepler, yeah, we no, just have the, to launch the, it past the, Cooper, the Kepler point. No, the Cooper Kepler belt. Damn. My science ignorance is shown right now. I swear I know more about space. <laughs> cut than look cut like. this out, David. Cut this Get out. This rid. Um, no, no, no. Unfortunately not. Uh, though you are sort of right. I mean, that is basically just dumping our trash into the void, but what's actually happening is this last third is just dumped here on Earth. Uh, a lot of it is thrown into waterways. A lot of it is washed away, ends up in the ocean like we talked about. Some of it is burned in pits, and these low-temperature burnings are extremely bad. Uh, they don't break down these chemicals as far as they should, so they put a lot of pollutants and toxic fumes into the air. And then, then there's a couple other very crude methods of disposal that basically amount to just leaving the trash somewhere. So right now, even with all this technology and knowledge we have about waste disposal after however many thousand years of having to deal with the problem, a third of our trash is just openly dumped. And, and that is obviously a huge problem. But maybe we should talk about what type of trash we are generating and dumping. Uh, I, want, I want to touch on food and organic material real quick, David, because it turns out in Canada, 58% of all food that is produced is either wasted or lost. And this is according to a report in January of this year. And the total value of this lost food comes out to $49 billion, which is enough to feed every single Canadian for five months. About two thirds of this food is wasted during the production or manufacturing cycle, with the rest being wasted at the consumer level. And this sounds excessive, right? And, and I mean, it, it, it is, but it's less of a Canadian quirk than a reflection of global trends. It's estimated today that 30% of all food that is produced is wasted or lost. And internationally, of all that global municipal solid waste that we generate, that 2.01 billion uh, ton figure, well, 44% of that is food and organic material. And at first, when I read that, I thought, well, maybe that's not so bad. You know, we produced a ton of waste, but at least half of it is organic material, right? Uh, then I realized Wait. the disaster of my thinking because... I mean, for one, as we've talked about, just because waste is biodegradable or or organic does not make it environmentally neutral, right? In in our episode six, Dead in the Water, we touched on ocean eutrophication, which is a process caused by the excessive runoff of agricultural fertilizer, organic material. Um, and similarly, when organic matter is left to rot in these huge unnatural concentrations in landfills, it releases a lot of methane, which as you know, is one of the most potent, although short-lived greenhouse gases that we have. And not to mention the greenhouse gases and other costs associated with producing food that didn't need to be produced in the first place. But I mean, this is not the first time we've talked about agriculture recently, even on this show, Daniel. It's one of our favorite topics here. And 50% of the global population absolutely is fed through this industrial model where we're growing these crops as commodities, of course, in very unsustainable ways. And then we ship these all around the world to these giant distributors who have to then package them and then send them off for sale in these regional grocery networks. So, of course, you're going to have the bulk of the waste during that complex supply chain. It's not just, you know, we're plucking these apples from these trees. We have to package it, 
put it with other apples, ship it off somewhere, unpackage it, sell it. it. It's complicated. But a lot of that is absolutely because of our need to ship these products so far from the original destination. If we could shift to a more local and sustainable model where we aren't having to package these things in such ridiculous ways, then we could cut out a huge amount of this waste. But consumers, for whatever reason, aren't interested in that. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen these just ridiculous things in stores here, Daniel, where I, I go into a I go into a grocery store or a corner bodega store and say I want an orange. And I guess they're not growing locally up here in New York. They have to be shipped, whatever. Uh, but oranges are these great fruit. It's covered in this natural protective layer, the rind, right? Keeps it fresh. Mm-hmm. I can peel it. It's perfect. Uh, but re- recently, I, I don't know who is doing this. Maybe you've seen these photos online, but I've seen them in real life as well. Uh, you have these pre-peeled oranges where the rind is removed, and then the, <laughs> the orange is wrapped in plastic. Like, uh, <laughs> what is the... We're, we're, we're literally removing this thing that is already doing the purpose and then using plastic to do it again. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, right, you try and right. buy apples, they're wrapped in saran wrap. Whatever these fruits, they just have all, all this additional unnecessary packaging. Even when some of these are coming from local places, I bought greens, for example, that are that on the side say grown in Brooklyn. So it, I know it's coming just from a, a short distance away, but it's given to me in a plastic box wrapped in saran wrap for some reason. And I don't even have an option to buy these things not in this this process. Maybe I should mention there's actually a store that opened up just down the street from me that calls himself a zero waste grocery store, which is a cool model Mm -hmm. um, where everything they bring in is bulk. They have like no packaging at all. You go into the store, everything is just in like buckets and uh, you have to bring your own stuff. Like if you want some rice, you bring your your mason jars, scoop it into there um, and then, you know, take it home by weight. Uh, all the fruits and produce and stuff, the, nothing is plastic. Nothing is in any sort of container that is one use. Uh, you have to bring your own or you can you can buy a glass there and then get a deposit back if you bring it back. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, it, and it's an encouraging model. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is taken from things that are grown locally to try and cut down on that waste that occurs in the process of shipping like we just talked about. And we'll talk about one-time use stuff as we go along, but I would love to see a sort of larger shift to this type of model. But I'm getting a little bit off topic from the different types of waste that we we're talking about here. So, well, you mentioned like one use products and all this packaging on our food, and which brings us to plastic. And plastic is an enormous share of all this waste. It's 12% of the solid waste that we generate in this municipal solid waste category, um, which is problematic for just an, an infinite number of reasons, some of which we talk about in episode 19, Life in Plastic. One of which being that this plastic breaks down into microplastics, which then infiltrate human water supplies, our food, and the gut of microorganisms that comprise the foundation of marine food webs, to name a few. But David, I want to come back to plastic in a little bit because there's a larger discussion to be had about that. You did mention earlier that we're talking specifically about this municipal solid waste here, but I do want to just give a couple figures on other types of waste. I think it's just important to keep in mind because total human consumption of goods and the waste generated by us is not limited to this end consumption of the products we consume in stores, but includes all the activities that go on to make that final consumption ultimately possible, right? Specifically, we have another category of waste called industrial waste. We have agricultural waste. We have waste from construction There is hazardous and medical waste not included in these figures and electronic waste from all our gadgets. And some of these can be much higher in terms of total waste than the ones that we're talking about. Specifically, industrial waste globally is created 18 times higher than municipal solid waste, with the highest levels occurring, of course, in rich areas. And while the global average per capita generation of industrial waste is around 12 and three quarters kilograms per person per day. It averages 42 kilograms per person in higher income countries and as low as 0.3 kilograms per person per day in low middle income countries. So just keep in mind the scale of all this waste that we're talking about, this is actually just a small chunk of all the the, uh, associated waste generated from our human activities. And like we touched on in our desertification episode, the cities that we construct, the urban lifestyles that we live 
These are all supported by these massive activities that go on behind the scenes, specifically cities, for example, requiring 200 times the city footprint in other land uses around the world just to make that life possible. And I think industrial waste is one of those things that kind of you know, slips the mind because that's truly a category that we don't see firsthand well, unless it's being burned and, <laughs> in our backyard and, and poisoning uh, the water supply. Breathed. And yeah, exactly. Well, uh, real quick, I just want to bring this back to that cow uh, comparison I mentioned earlier. So, uh, if we're just talking global average, not even this one that's adjusted for uh, first world versus developing world, whatever, I-, I mentioned that about annually we're doing half a cow worth of trash each. But if you add this industrial waste and if you add this agricultural waste, just to visualize how much waste is generated on your behalf to allow the world to function as it is right now. Three cows. <laughs> More than three cows. Daniel, your diary's going up. It is about 12 cows of trash per person every single year. Seven billion times every single year. I mean, that is a huge amount of garbage that is being generated on our behalf to create this global civilization that we have today. No wonder when we're looking at how much waste we're creating in order to live the way that we do, that everything is basically entirely unsustainable. How can you think that we're extracting this much stuff and throwing away this much stuff? 12 cows worth of garbage every single year can approach anything even remotely resembling sustainability. But let's not get dragged down on this cow stuff because when we're talking about trash and we're talking about this problem and the recycling problems that we're about to get into that maybe you've heard about in the news with the China ban, uh, what we're really talking about is the economy of trash, the market that is the global municipal waste trade. When we have some stats on the global trade for trash, specifically, uh, you know, it's expected to reach four hundred and eighty-four billion dollars in value by 2025, which is a jump from 300 billion in 2017. But David, I- I'm too excited to get to this whole recycling industry. I think that's the more important uh, discussion here because this is what we you mentioned that we're creating all this trash and, and waste in unsustainable ways, but many people look to recycling as the solution for that. And I think this is where the discussion truly gets interesting. So to kick this off, I said we'd get back to plastic and mm-hmm. Of all the plastic the world has produced between 1950 and 2015, less than 10% of it has been recycled, right? And we alluded to these figures earlier, but in the United States, we're around 4.4% of all our waste gets recycled, and that's expected to plummet to somewhere around 2% uh, based on what we're about to talk about. And we discussed the Chinese ban on foreign trash last year when this was just going into effect. And now, a year later, we're, we're seeing dramatic effects from that ban. And so let's look at this, because this is a perfect example of how, by and large, the industry for recycling around the world is basically, David, a giant scam. Recycling as a scam, Daniel, those are heavy words and something I don't think a lot of people uh, would think necessarily would go together. But really, that's what's happened. I mean, we in grade school were taught all about recycling, right? The three R's, they would tell us. Uh, though I think there's a better case to be made that there should be five R's, and I'll get to that at the end of the show. Reuse, reuse, reduce, and recycle. Well, you got them wrong and out of order. (laughs) Reduce, reuse, recycle. But yeah, all those R's are actually there. Um, And unfortunately, more and more, we really don't pay any attention to the first two, reduce and reuse. And most of the focus of our efforts of our uh, cultural participation is on the third one, recycling. And there was a big campaign several decades ago to really get people to recycle. And that's for good reason. I, again, I feel like we do this a lot in the show where we're talking about something that is is good, Daniel, you know, like our philanthropy episode. Don't get us wrong. Recycling is great. We should all be recycling. But uh, I... Owning change. I just want to... Great episode. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to expose some of the the not so great motivations for creating this. And we've alluded to this in the past in some other episodes, but basically the modern recycling movement, as we understand it, is about shifting the burden of trash creation from these corporations, from these industries, like you mentioned, this huge amount of industrial waste, Daniel, that's created, and placing the burden of dealing with all these problems on the individual, on each and every one of us. And and this was a huge PR coup made by these companies because they were able to shift these very cheap one-time use packaging and products that were a lot more affordable for them to create, 
a lot easier for the mass production schedules to ship out. But I mean, obviously, this means that they're generating a huge amount of trash. And in a responsible society, we would say, no, you know, this is not acceptable. Yeah, it's going to cost you more to make reusable stuff or things that are easily recycled. But that's what we should do because it's environmentally responsible. But instead, these corporations were able to say, no, you know, it's not us that have to deal with these problems. It's y'all. You are the end users. You are the ones ultimately holding the garbage in your hands. So therefore, it's your responsibility to take care of that problem. And thus, the recycling program really got kicked off to make people feel like they were responsible for taking care of this. And so we as children are taught, hey, if it's plastic, throw it in the recycling bin. Hey, if it's paper, throw it in the recycling bin. Uh, If it's cardboard, put it in the recycling bin. Glass, you know, all these things. And in different parts of the world, there's different responsibilities. Um, Some places are much better about their recycling. They sort it out. They'll say, okay, clear glass here, colored glass here, metal goes here, uh, papers over here. And there are reasons for that. This is another thing that we mentioned, like Taiwan, where you have to be very aware that recycling isn't just a one size fits all thing. You can't just throw everything in a machine and it recycles it. There's a lot of manual sorting and uh, separation that needs to be done or else you get contamination and whole batches can be wasted. That leads to fees and makes things more expensive. And we'll get to that. But here, at least in the United States, so much of the recycling is like, oh, yeah, put it all in the blue bin and we'll sort it out later, which is a very American way to approach these problems. And we think that we're doing something good with this. But unfortunately, that's not the case. A lot of this recycling ends up as garbage. And that's not even talking about those fake recycling bins where it's like you're at Starbucks, they say that you're recycling and they just throw it out. Uh, But I I mean, the actual ones that are picked up by recycling trucks, most of our trash, most of our recycling all go more or less to the same place despite our best efforts, despite the good that we think we're doing when we are recycling. And don't get me wrong, don't not recycle if you have that option available to you, especially aluminum and especially glass. Uh, We save huge amounts of energy recycling those. Those are about the only profitable things to recycle. But things like plastic, things like paper, a lot of that ultimately, unfortunately, ends up in garbage dumps. Real quick to clarify, David, I think there, there's a couple of things going on. One, I, I totally agree with companies shifting the responsibility from themselves to consumers. But to clarify, based on what you're saying, I think it's more that they've been successful at shifting the perception of responsibility to individuals. Because as we see, even when we try super hard to recycle and we sort everything, it, like you said, it does just end up in the landfill or it doesn't go where we think it is. But there's another thing going on, which is companies that actually are employing some kind of recycling uh, process, but it may not be for the reasons we think it is. Here's uh, Von Hernandez of the Break Free from Plastic Initiative. Quote, what's happening in Southeast Asia, what's happening in Malaysia, shows just how bankrupt the recycling system really is. Consumers, especially those in the West, are conditioned to believe that when they separate their recyclables and throw them out, that it will be properly taken care of. But that has been exposed as a myth. So when China announced that it would no longer be importing foreign recyclables and their waste, wealthy countries, particularly the UK and United States, immediately faced a predicament. These countries produce way more garbage than they have the land and infrastructure to handle. So they have been shipping a large percent of it to China under the guise of recycling. And to be clear, what China banned specifically is any plastic waste that isn't pure. And they're serious about it too. China is inspecting and rejecting crates of trash at its border, sending back paper shipments from the US that were mixed with glass or sending back crates of lead concentrate contaminated with mineral ash back to South Korea. But in fact, this practice of shipping waste to China has been so widespread that the country became responsible for importing and processing 72% of the world's total plastic waste. And since they started importing trash 27 years ago, they have collectively processed 45% of the global total. So we're talking about a massive share of global waste that had been shipped to China. But with this ban, China's import of trash is expected to be a mere 1% of previous imports. So not surprisingly, since the ban, trash has been piling up within these wealthier countries, which we'll get to. But first... Let's talk about one of the supply chain innovations that took place immediately. That that's that practically overnight, wealthy countries like the US, the UK, Japan, Germany, Australia shifted shipments of garbage from China into Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and other Southeast Asian countries where it's been piling up ever since in ports 
eventually to be taken up by an emerging illegal consortium of recycling factories that skirt regulations, destroy the environment, and dump this unusable waste in towering piles. Where else, Daniel? But in poor neighborhoods. And how many mafias have we talked about on this show? But, I mean, we have sand mafias. We have, I guess, regular mafias. Well, there are huge... Water mafias. Yeah, there are huge, vibrant communities of trash mafias as well. And I don't think anything highlights the inefficiencies of this global system of, of trade and capitalism as well as the fact that we, for some reason, are taking garbage and shipping it halfway around the world just so somebody else will allow it to destroy their environment instead of where it came from. And, and this is a huge hundreds of billions of dollars industry. That's insane. But Well, I don't even think they allow it, David. This is, this is something that um, the world really didn't know was going on uh, until China was basically like, yeah, yeah, we're not accepting this anymore. And a lot of the US, for example, a lot of these countries, like you mentioned, just tried as best they could to start shipping these things to other poor countries in Southeast Asia. In the first six months of 2018, plastic waste imports in Indonesia increased by 56%. In Vietnam, it doubled. And at one point, they had 9,000 shipping crates full of plastic just piling up in ports. Malaysia's plastic imports from the United States similarly doubled. And Thailand experienced a 13-fold increase in plastic waste imports, experiencing a 30,000 shipping crate pileup. And the governments of some of these countries didn't even know this was happening until these these crates started piling up on their on their shore and all this smoke from these illegal burn pits that were uh, spreading around the country started making people sick. And they're like, what is going on? So let's talk about real quick the illegal operations, these these recyclable mafia consortiums, if you will, David. And here's a quote from Dominique Morsbergen writing in Huffington Post earlier this month. Quote, <clears throat> Processing contaminated plastic recyclables requires more sorting to sift out the good stuff and incurs additional costs for legal recyclers, which need to meet regulatory requirements and shell out cash to discard whatever waste they aren't able to recycle. Unlicensed recyclers, however, can set up factories and hire workers cheaply and illegally access groundwater for the recycling process. Without any environmental regulations to worry about, these recyclers can leave contaminated water untreated, which has been affecting local waterways and biodiversity. Leftover recyclables that can't be processed can be dumped illegally, in other words, for free. Often, these dumped plastics are then burned, their noxious fumes polluting neighborhoods and sickening residents. These naughty boys are importing a lot of what's basically just rubbish, said Johnson Lai, a licensed recycler based near the Malaysian capital, referring to the rash of illegal recycling facilities that have cropped up around the country. The recyclables they import, they're so contaminated and poorly sorted that only approximately 30% of it can be used. The rest ends up getting dumped. Well, I think it's worth noting here too, Daniel, why this ban happened in China that caused this huge cascade and everyone scrambling and the creation of these mafias uh, in the first place. And, and that was in large part because of this film that appeared in China, it's called Plastic China, uh, about this sort of homespun recycling, and I use air quotes there, though you can't see it, industry that exists in China uh, to take this Western waste and turn it into something profitable uh, at the expense of environmental and human health. Uh, it caused waves across the country and ultimately the world, and now we're dealing with the consequences. It's a really fascinating documentary. I encourage everyone to check it out if you can. Uh, obviously, you can rent it, buy it. It's called Plastic China. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you can watch it there for free. Um, but it follows a family, a migrant family living near a port town uh, on the coast of China's Yellow Sea, uh, just kind of documenting their day-to-day -day life, living in this reality of being part of this town where everyone's job, there's these 5,000 recycling operations, and they're a part of it. And essentially what their job is, they pick up these huge bales of unsorted plastic waste from some central location. They take it back to what is their home. And it just, it just piles up everywhere. And you have mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, all sitting and living in this plastic waste, sorting it by hand. There's images of children who 
will take a lighter and burn the plastic so they can smell it to figure out what kind it is. Um, children are sorting medical waste. They're bathing in this plastic because it invades their home. They're cooking in it. Uh, they use they use this plastic to for burning to fuel their cooking fires or or to provide warmth. And it's a really dirty business, you know, sleeping in this plastic, sorting it, putting it through these machines, which chop it up into really small pieces, which they're then breathing in. And then they run it through another machine, which kind of churns out this like plastic goop, which then gets shredded into pellets, which get sold back as manufacturing inputs to someone. And of course, now that this ban took place in China, a lot of these people are out of work. And these are the ones taking their recycling operations to Malaysia and other Southeast Asian countries and setting up shop there where if before they were in some kind of unsafe environment, they sure as hell are now. But to me, it's just a great revealer of the sham that is this recycling industry. Like we alluded to earlier, David, if recycling from the perspective of these markets for it, and in the context of our current economic models, if it's about saving the planet, then why are people willing to do this work illegally in a way that destroys the local environment, polluting waterways and soil? and under working conditions that are pretty much guaranteed to get you cancer. And ultimately, it's because they can make a profit doing it. But how can they make a profit doing this environmentally green initiative to save the planet? It's because ultimately, this recycling comes down to that it's not about saving the planet. It's about lowering the cost for certain manufacturing inputs, which don't get me wrong, that that concept is great. The concept of lowering manufacturing costs, improving efficiency, uh, decreasing waste and the things that we produce. All these things are great in isolation. But if those concepts are used to increase production of things that we shouldn't really be making in the first place, at the end of the day, we have a net loss to the environment and to society. Well, after that, Daniel, maybe it's a little bit gauche to try and talk about the effects of this on the US when it's quite literally killing people uh, abroad, but it has had profound effects here at home in the United States, as well as other countries like we mentioned, especially the UK. And over the past few decades, the US has been exporting around a third of all its recyclables of all its recyclables to China. But these are primarily the type of mixed plastics that you find in municipal waste. Eighty percent of this mixed plastic waste has been going to China, and the reason is because one of the main limiting factors in terms of cost for recycling is the labor. Plastics are complex, and there are so many different types. You know, you've seen them on the bottom. It'll say one, it'll say two. Your municipality probably only accepts one or two of these types of plastics, but you're throwing everything in there. Everybody does. It's okay. Uh, So you need people to sort all that stuff and figure out which one it has to go in. And this is expensive. Colored bottles need to be separated from clear bottles. Plastic with food on it has to be cleaned so the food contamination is removed. Plastic wrap itself is something that can't be recycled because it jams the machine, so that has to be taken out and thrown away. A number one soda bottle will melt differently than a number one vegetable container. All these things are complicated, complex, and add to the expense of all this because they need to be manually sorted by people. And this is why plastics in other sectors like industrial waste, where things are more standardized, are typically easier to recycle. That uniform nature of the products that they're creating make it much easier to process. And so it's, it's only really this complicated mixture of mess that we find particularly in municipal waste, which is why we're really focusing on that in this episode, that is expensive because of this labor component. And that's why we've been outsourcing it, because U.S. labor is just too expensive to do this efficiently. We could do it here, but the cost of your recycling would skyrocket. And in fact, many municipalities in the United States have seen this happen over the past few years, causing them to take all sorts of drastic actions. So, I mean, we have some examples of this, too. There's this great report that looks at uh, every single state and how much they've been impacted by these recycling bans and some of the municipalities, how they're responding to this. And uh, one of these cities here, we're just going to pick out and, and pick on a couple of these. There's a place called Chester City in Pennsylvania that's just outside Philadelphia. And they are now sending half of all the recycling to an incinerator. So you think you're sorting stuff out, you think it's going to go and save the earth, but this stuff is ultimately just being burned at the amount of 200 tons a day, in addition to the already 3,500 tons of trash that they already were incinerating. Residents are worried about this additional plastic that is being burned, that's worsening their air quality, and this is a town that we need to remember that already has a 40% rate of asthma among children, 
and elevated levels of heart disease and cancer. So there are very valid reasons to be concerned about this increased side effects from this recycling ban here in the United States. And, and this is just one of many examples. There are municipalities that have just stopped accepting certain types of recyclables. I mentioned several are no longer taking plastics or they've limited which plastics they will now accept. Some of them are only taking paper now. Some of them are refusing to take paper at all. There's a city in New Hampshire that just canceled all their recycling collection. Uh, there's a town in Oregon called Grants Pass that told its residents to keep recycling, you know, keep putting everything in the bins, but then we're just taking those bins and throwing them in the landfill. There's a wide variety of responses, some worse than others, but the main theme from it all is that most of these states and most of these cities are panicking and they don't know what to do. I reached out to a guy who has worked in this industry as a driver and he gave us permission to repeat a written statement. Um, and I want to read that here. This comes from uh, Firewire Best Wire and they write, I've seen the garbage business firsthand from the driver's seat of the front end truck. I can tell 100% that even if you sort it properly, even if it all goes in the right bin, when I show up and my boss has ordered me to dump the bin, I'm dumping it in my truck. I've talked back, but the end of that conversation is always, do you want to keep working here? You let me worry about that. On a regular day, recycling and garbage are scheduled to have separate trucks. But what about when someone calls in sick? Well, those customers still need their bins emptied. If I dump a bin of garbage into my recycling load, the whole load is now contaminated and can't go to the recycling facility we use. If I dump a bin of recycling into a garbage load, of course it's just going straight to the garbage. Guess what? Someone calls in sick about every other day. And guess what? I know people who sort at that recycling facility. If your plastic is not clear, it's coming out the conveyor and going into the garbage that they themselves produce. I can't remember, but I think all glass goes garbage too. They are pretty much set up to intercept wood, paper, metal, and clear plastics. After that, it's just garbage of their own. Luckily, they happen to run a garbage dump on their own property. LOL. Compliance among customers is pretty bad. Recycling is supposed to cost customers less because it costs us less. But if what's in the bin is not recycling, then the recycling center will charge back the load as garbage to us. That's another way I can get fired. So technically, I'm supposed to check every single bin I dump to ensure it can be recycled. Do they schedule enough time for me to do that? No, of course not. We compete with the city and we are cheaper than they are. The reason we are cheaper is because we get paid less and our bosses cut corners. The likelihood of anyone in the public ever finding out about compliance rates among third-party contractors with garbage laws is pretty low. At the end of the day, what's going to kill us is what's in the air, not landfills, which is why this story is so bad. But my city has land around in every direction. Philly is pretty much locked up for landfill space, I would imagine. Um, he goes on to say, I would like to point out that our city has a pretty comprehensive composting program and organic waste is collected in separate bins and rapidly composted in a local facility. Once a year, residents can get that compost for free in their own containers. Composting is required of all residences and businesses in the city. Compliance? It's not terrible and there are a lot of people who think they can just drop their fast food bag in there. I'm sure that the industrial processes for recycling are more energy intensive than composting though, especially for glass and colored plastics. Well, I mean, that's a really revealing look from somebody who is quite literally driving the trucks, Daniel. But I, I want to turn back once more to a quote from that Dominic Mosbergen uh, and how they sort of reframe this recycling conversation. Uh, I, I think it's enlightening. So let me just read this real quick. Activists say that Chinese recyclers have been setting up factories, often illegally, across Malaysia and have been processing and disposing of waste without regulatory oversight. Whatever they manage to recycle is allegedly flowing back to China, where it's used for manufacturing. China still needs a lot of raw materials. You have to understand that recycling is really about manufacturing, and it's only about manufacturing, continued Minter, whose family has operated a scrap business in Minnesota for several generations. We've come to see recycling as this environmental thing that's dusted with green fairy dust. But recyclables are really raw materials. And the reason they went to China in the first place is because all the manufacturing was happening there. And it continues to go there now because manufacturing is still happening. And that's the end of that quote. And I think it's really important to understand recycling in this context without the greenwashing that we alluded to earlier when, when they're trying to redefine recycling as this sort of individual thing we're doing for the environment. Uh -huh. uh, and remember that most of the recycling conversation is really one about markets and efficiencies and how much it costs to do something. 
So we mentioned this labor problem and how recycling just isn't profitable for the most part. Um, and, and it's interesting, actually, a lot of this uh, difficulty that's happening right now in recycling in the United States is actually great for these waste management companies because recycling was kind of a lost leader that they were running in order to capture these these municipal contracts for waste uh, disposal, both recycling and, and, and uh, traditional waste. And now that these municipalities are freaking out and not uh, wanting to foot the bill for the recycling, allowing these waste companies instead to shift things to the landfill, their bottom line has increased dramatically. They don't have to deal with these expensive recycling costs, even if in the first place they were just shipping them off to China. That's an expensive process versus dumping these things in these systems they already have running. I, I think this uh, just this whole shifting our garbage to Malaysia and these these other countries, and then you know that what we can't ship, we're just throwing in the landfill while still telling consumers that we're recycling their stuff. I think it just reveals you know just the giant sham that this recycling industry is. And I think there's two important things to take away from this, which is one, the United States and these wealthier countries, I always got the impression from this PR and these companies that that talk about their green initiatives, that we had this advanced technology and that we in these wealthy countries had just built up this infrastructure to handle this waste and we were recycling it and doing all this stuff. But in reality, we've been saying we've been recycling because we've been shipping it to someone else. And if we don't have the infrastructure to handle this stuff, what makes us think some poor country halfway around the world does either? And so the only, if we can't handle this waste, the only way forward in a sustainable way is to produce less of it. And again, this kind of goes back to that, you know, evergreen debate about who's more at fault, the consumer or the producer. But as we talked about in episode Designing Deception, we have a consumer economy because those who owned the capital, those who owned the manufacturing centers, the factories, and the investment bankers who made money off of investing in those factories, these people wanted us as a population to consume more to fuel their economic growth. It's not, it's not the other way around. We're not consuming all this plastic, and that demand is what's driving the production of it. It's completely the other way around. And again, going back to that episode about PR men and how they seek to shift our habits and our lifestyles around things that are profitable for them, it's really easy to think about in your own life how we make choices every day that we're kind of indifferent to. You know, if you go to a fast food joint and you order some food, at the end of the day, you're not really impacted in your own life if they give you a paper plate or a plastic plate. You don't really have a choice in the matter. And so we just need to be hyper aware that when companies try to shift this recyclable uh, burden onto us as individuals, when the narrative becomes the way we're going to save the world is by refusing straws, we need to recognize that this narrative is backwards. It, it needs to come from the other direction. If we're going to solve this problem of this, this waste buildup that we can't handle, the companies, the manufacturing owners have to produce less. They have to find better ways to package it so we're not uh, tearing off the skin of an orange and then wrapping it in plastic wrap. I mean, all this stuff sounds really dirty, Daniel, but there are some actual, like literal scams in this process <laughs> as well. And we, we came across some of these and I think they're worth showing and just to illustrate how dirty this trash industry is, I guess, which isn't surprising <laughs> to anybody. So Waste Management Inc., I mentioned them before. They are a very large U.S. public company. In fact, they're the largest waste company in the U.S., third in the entire world. And between 1992 and 1998, several of the top executives committed, committed a series of financial frauds to corrupt the company's actual earnings. They avoided reporting expenses. They inflated their profits. Typical cooking the book kind of stuff. And they even paid bribes to Arthur Anderson, which at the time was one of the largest and most respected consulting and accounting firms in the world. And Arthur Anderson, David, would go on to uh, do the same thing for Enron, the energy company that went bankrupt in the early 2000s. And that's why Arthur Anderson is not alive today anymore. It was kind of shamed out of existence. They still are functioning more or less exactly the same as Accenture, who you've probably heard of. It's the same company. But at the time, they were one of the largest and most respected consulting and accounting firms in the world, and they were paid to cover up the scandal. When in 1998, waste management could no longer hide its true value, it readjusted its market price by over $1.7 billion, at the time the largest restatement in all of history. But there's more. 
In 2002, the mayor and a handful of city council people in the Californian city of Carson were caught accepting huge bribes in exchange for contracts with a trash company, which was a subsidiary of Allied Waste Industries, another large player. The contract was for 10 years, valued at $60 million, and one of the largest bribes offered to an individual in that case was $1.5 million. When you think about like the mafia, the mafia businesses in America, David, it really does conjure up these types of businesses, you know, like concrete builders and these companies that can really take advantage of the way that government is often the gatekeeper for these contracts, right? Where you don't think of these businesses as being particularly sexy, but that's exactly why it might appeal, I guess, to this type of uh, uh, criminal activity because it's a cash cow. If you can get that contract for 10 years guaranteed for certain city, and there's going to be very little oversight, and you're going to tell residents that you're recycling, and you're going to charge a premium for that, but in reality, you're just going to throw it in the, the landfill and no one's going to know. But that's a great business. I just assume like half these trash companies are associated with the mob. I, I don't have any reason why, but uh, it seems like it would make sense. It's also probably a great way to get rid of a body. Just saying. Well, large scams, actual convicted scams aside, Daniel, maybe we should get to the end of this episode and talk about what we can do. Uh, I know that's sort of one of the things that was driving the original scams here, trying to shift this what we can do to each and every one of us with the recycling campaigns, which again, everybody should recycle. Don't get that wrong. Uh, recycling is good in theory. Uh, it's just the way that we've, we've uh, put it into practice that is problematic. Well, let's actually nail down some things that we can do. Well, not something we can do as individuals, but one of the most interesting uh, potential solutions, at least a, a sign of progress going forward, there's an international treaty called the Basel Convention that took effect in 1992, and it attempts to prevent developed countries from exploiting poor countries, forcing them to import hazardous waste, um, at least without their consent. And there are various protocols associated with this trade. But this plastic waste that we've talked about is not included in that treaty. And that's part of the reason why those Southeast Asian countries had no idea that all this plastic waste was being shipped to their country. Uh, well, now Norway has proposed to include plastic waste in this treaty, and that would go a long way in, at the very least, helping us track where it's coming from and where it's going. Since at the moment, there really is no good comprehensive data on plastic waste and the way it's transferred between countries. Um, and best case scenario, it would give poor nations more leverage to refuse the garbage of these wealthy nations. Uh, here's the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment. Quote, by explicitly including plastic waste in the scope of the Basel Convention, these waste streams can be controlled and mismanagement of plastic waste avoided. We believe the proposed changes will lead to less marine plastic litter, increased traceability, more control, and less illegal dumping of plastic waste. And here's Malaysia's Minister of Environment, Yao Bi Yin, who herself had no idea the scale of global waste until that Chinese ban. Quote, The citizens of the developed world need to demand that their governments be transparent about the way they track their waste. Where exactly is your trash going? Where are your plastics going? What irritates me is the injustice. The injustice seeing people in the developing world suffering from the rubbish originating in developed countries. I don't think citizens of these countries know what's happening. Maybe even lawmakers don't know. It cannot continue as business as usual. Uh, finally, David, I'm throwing a lot of quotes at you, but, but here's Jenna Jambeck. I'm ready. A National Geographic explorer and researcher of solid waste, writing in a 2018 paper. Quote, of relevance to this discussion is the fact that the International Basel Convention, which governs the exports of hazardous and other waste, already exists. If plastic waste were characterized as a waste requiring special consideration under this convention, then export could potentially be regulated. It would also provide a framework for knowledge sharing and promotion of the proper management of waste, including harmonization of technical standards and practices, which could help build capacity to properly manage plastic waste around the world. There's a lot of good information there, Daniel. 
these are about regulating and controlling the broken systems that we already have for the most part. Redefining plastic waste as something that needs to be tracked that can't be just thrown away to these developing countries and our environmental and health damage shifted to them for a basic fee. And I mean, that's a great start. I don't want to knock it. But if we want to really cure this trash program, if we want to take care of those, what did I say, 12 cows worth of garbage that's generated for each of us individually, annually, then we need... It's a lot more than three, I'll tell you that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Then we really need to look at these systems that create all this waste in the first place. And earlier in the episode, Daniel, you mentioned those three R's that were taught since elementary school, reduce, reuse, recycle. And I want to mention that there's actually a movement to push it to five R's. And I think this is a great start, not just for us individually, but culturally and around the world to take these really to heart and put them into practice. So the five R's. Refuse. If you don't need something, don't buy it. You don't need a plastic cup or a straw, don't take it. The less stuff that we take in the first place, the less motivation there is to make it. And again, I'm not a bottom up sort of boycott kind of person. Uh, These things rarely work or catch on. But if this is a global rule that we all really take to heart, then it actually will have some sort of uh, effective consequences on the production of these materials in the first place. So number one, R, refuse. Number two, reduce. We already know this one. So if you're already taking stuff, try and use less of it. This is both in terms of consumption, but also in terms of how we, you know, we don't need multiple straws. We don't need multiple cups. Uh, and I'm, I'm riffing on these straws and cups because of the recent straw bans that we're starting to see around the country um, and because they're a very visible plastic source of garbage that many of us are familiar with in our day-to-day lives that just we don't need. How many cups exist already? Uh, there's these, these companies could instead give us glass cups if we're staying inside. We could bring our own cups. There's lots of availability for doing our own part on this practice. That would save both us money, save the environment, and also save these companies money in the end uh, at the expense of time and convenience. But that aside, so refuse, reduce, reuse, which we also know if you can, if possible, reuse these things, reuse cups, reuse straws, reuse whatever it is as much as you can until you can't anymore, brings us to number four, repurpose. If this product that you're using that you can no longer reuse, is there another way that it can be used? Switch it to that. Uh, sometimes I've seen people turn these, these little plastic cups into, uh, pots for plants. Uh, there's lots of clever things we can do to turn these things that would otherwise end up in a landfill into something productive or beautifying or a way to make our world a better place. And if we can think of those, we should encourage them instead of looking at them and saying, oh, that's quaint or that's cute or that's a nice little Pinterest project, but instead say, oh, what a great idea. Let me do that myself. And of course, number five, recycle. And I think what's important here is also making sure that our recycling is kept accountable. That means if we are recycling, make sure that we know what we can recycle, that we are not recycling things that will cause problems with the batches that we're sending off. That means don't throw your pizza boxes in these recycling bins. That spoils the entire bin. You can't do that. Know which things can be recycled, which things can't. The best places to recycle them. All these are important, but also holding our municipalities accountable with what they do with our recycling. And this is important. It's part of the electoral and political process. We need to be there saying it's not just enough that you offer some sort of recycling, but that we know that what you say is being recycled actually is. And that's not being shipped off somewhere else, out of sight, out of mind, or ending up in our landfills or garbage dumps like we've seen some of these municipalities turn to. So accountability across the board, both individually, and then also reaching out to these companies themselves saying, hey, why are you doing this? There's no reason to create so many one-use products. And we'll get into this larger idea of waste in future episodes. I think it's an important thing and there's lots to be said on it, which is why we didn't really tackle it today. And I want to quickly also point to some programs that some cities are running that are trying to counter some of this waste. Um, New York recently started this up. It's very popular in San Francisco as well. But these large-scale composting programs where you'll have a second trash bin that the municipality provides, it's for all your organic compostable material. You'll throw it in this. Uh, The city will take these, send them out to somewhere that's composted, it's turned into useful material that can be reused and repurposed to to hit a couple of our R's, and uh, make sure that all that stuff is not ending up in these landfills and it's not being washed away into the ocean or rivers causing that eutrophication, like you mentioned, Daniel. Right. 
We need to blame these corporations for overproducing this waste that we can't manage. And we do love to name and shame these companies. And there's a way that you can participate in that. There's a uh, movement called Break Free from Plastic. It's global in scope. And they have something called the Brand Audit. And you can be a part of that. It's a kind of a crowdsource system where find their Brand Audit Toolkit on their website, which we'll link to. And if, you, if there's an area near you that has a lot of uh, trash, pollution, uh, especially on the coast or something like that, you can go there, uh, maybe grab some friends or some other volunteers. You can help clean up that area, but also sort it and then record in their database where all this plastic pollution came from, what companies produced and all this. And this goes into an annual report that helps inform the public about who are the most egregious contributors of all this plastic that we're going to be swimming in in the next couple of years. Anything else? Oh, uh, finally, I just want to offer a correction. Last week, we talked about the Carbondale Spring Movement. (laughs) Uh, That is not in Colorado. That is in Southern Illinois. And uh, so if you go back to last week's episode page, Above the Paving Stones, The Desert, you'll find a link to the Carbondale Spring website, as well as the site that has a lot of the philosophy behind what they're doing. I encourage you to check that out. And again, we'll keep track of that progress and report back. We should ask him about the recycling. Yes, we should. (laughs) Yeah, although they're successful in implementing a permaculture model of food production, we can expect less waste generation in the first place. Reduce. Refuse. Refuse. Reduce. Reuse. Repurpose. Recycle. Lots to think about. As always, Daniel. But think about it. We hope you will. You can find more information on all of this. You can see some photos, find links, read papers, as well as a full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use advertising to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, or supporting us on patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. You can get a sticker and share it with the world. You can also find us on all your favorite social media networks at ashes ashes cast. We've also got a discord community where we hang out all day. It's a great group of people. We would love to see you there. There are links to that on the website as well as on our subreddit page. Just click and you can get registered there very quickly. It's, it's a great community. Shout out to everybody there. We love hanging out with you. Next week, we've got a little bit of a different type of episode, but something we're looking forward to, and we think you'll enjoy it as well. So we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.